We come to a new section in the Gospel of Luke, and I want you to note it. It runs from chapter 3, verse 1, to chapter 4, verse 13. Chapter 3, verse 1, to chapter 4, verse 14. What section is it? It's the introduction of the Son of Man. So we have the preparation for the Son of Man. Now we have the introduction for the Son of Man. And Luke introduces the Son of Man in four ways we're going to look at over the next three weeks in our study. First, through John the Baptist and his ministry. Secondly, through the baptism of Jesus at the Jordan River, when the Father said, this is my beloved Son in whom my soul delights. And then thirdly, through his genealogy. Luke gives us the genealogy of Jesus traced through Mary going back to Adam the first, or Adam that created in the garden. And then number four, his temptation. So I want you to see this over the next few weeks. The witness of Jesus from John the Baptist, the witness to Jesus of his baptism, the witness to Jesus the Son of Man in his genealogy, and fourthly, the witness to Jesus in his temptation. Now this morning we look only at the first, the witness of John the Baptist, and what a man he was. Jesus said this about John, write it down, Matthew 11, 11. Truly I say unto you, among them that were born of women, there hath not risen one greater than John the Baptist. Now when Jesus said among those born of women, that pretty much covers everyone, right? Everyone's born of a woman. So Jesus is saying that he's the greatest individual that has ever lived, at least up to that point, and I would venture to say even to today. He's only second to Jesus Christ himself. He said, greater is no one among those who are born of women than John the Baptist. John was the last of the Old Testament prophets, and he was the first of the New Testament preachers. Actually, we're going to see that John was born in the tribe of Levi, so he could be a priest. He was called of God to be a prophet, and then he became a preacher. So the greatest man that ever lived, born a priest, became a prophet, and then became a preacher. Now, I believe it's fitting to say that he was the last of the Old Testament prophets, the first of the New Testament preachers. So he bridges the gap between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, there's a marvelous prophecy where it's predicted that he would come to prepare the way of the Lord. He's called the voice of him that cries in the wilderness. Isaiah 40, verse 3, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Now, John's mission was quite simple. Number one, he would prepare the way of the Lord. Number two, he would point people to the Lord. And number three, he would get out of the way of the Lord. I like that. So he would prepare the way of the Lord, he would point people to the Lord, and then he would get out of the way because he said, he must increase and I must decrease. Now all four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, record the ministry of John the Baptist. I'd love someday, Lord willing, to do an actual series on the life and ministry of John the Baptist. So you could take topically and chronologically his life. It's a marvelous thing. But all four Gospels mention John the Baptist. Now this morning, I want to put it into four categories if you're taking notes. I want to first look at John's preparation for his ministry, verses 1 to 2, his preparation. Let's read that. Luke says, now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of Iturea, of the reign of Trigonatus and Licinius, the tetrarch of Abilene, Annas and Caiaphas, being high priest, verse 2, and here it is, the word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. Now again, I don't want to get too bogged down, but there's so much we can say about John. First, let's look at his home. It's hinted at in verse 2, the son of Zacharias. We know that chapter 1, verse 5 and 6 said that he also had a mother by the name of Elizabeth. And we know the story 
of how Gabriel came to Zacharias when he was in the temple doing his priestly duties and said, your prayers have been heard. Your wife is going to have a son. You'll call him John, and he will be great in the sight of the Lord. But the point I want to make is that uh, John was born into a godly home. Let me read chapter 1 of Luke, verse 5 and 6. It says that his father was a priest, so he's of the tribe of Levi. Both his father and his mother were righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and the ordinances of the Lord blameless. Now, how's that for a godly home? You're born in the tribe of Levi. Your father is a priest. Angels visit him before you're born. They announce your birth. Your, your mom and your dad are both righteous, walking in the ordinances and the commandments of the Lord. And I just want to make this point before I move on, that homes are the maker of men. Homes are where children are molded and developed and shaped, and God uses that as the cradle of civilization in the home. As goes the home, so goes the nation. As goes our nation, so goes the world. So the home is so very important. Nothing can take the place of a godly father and a godly mother and the influence that they would have upon their children in that home. So God give us godly families, godly marriages. Notice this consecration, secondly, and that's, again, I'm alluding to chapter 1, verse 13 through 15, where he was announced by angels, Gabriel to Zacharias. The angel said he should be great in the sight of the Lord. He will drink neither wine nor strong drink, so he was separated as a Nazarite. And it says that he'll be filled with the Holy Spirit, from his mother's womb. Now, how's that for preparation? Born into a godly home, filled with the Spirit while he's still in his mother's womb. How marvelous that is. So this is his preparation in the area of his consecration to God. And then thirdly, notice his preparation in verse 80 of chapter 1 of Luke. The child grew, waxed strong in spirit, and was in the desert till the day that it was showing was unto Israel. So he abandoned the priesthood in the temple. He went into the wilderness of Judea, and God was prepping him, teaching him, preparing him to be not just a priest, but to be a prophet and to be a preacher. And think about how many great men of God were called out of the desert, Moses being one great example. Forty years in Pharaoh's court becoming somebody, 40 years out in the backside of the desert becoming nobody, and then 40 years God using somebody who became a nobody for his glory and his exodus. So Moses was called by God out of the desert, the burning bush, remember that. And you know how old Moses was when God called him? Buckle your seatbelts. He was 80. I just want to sit down and rest when I hear that. He was just getting started at 80 years of age. Wow, that's amazing. So God help us to trust the Lord to prepare us and to use us. And if you're old, God may take you to the desert, but he's not through with you yet. David was called from the desert. Jesus will be tempted in the wilderness before his public ministry begins. But then fourthly, notice John's calling in his preparation. Go back with me to verse 1 and 2. He was called in a very dark time. Now, I don't have time to break down all the dates of all these rulers, but here we have Luke the historian. He was a historian of first rate. And he didn't say just in a land far away and a long, long time ago lived a king, but he mentions, and he uses Roman authorities from the top, uh, Tiberius Caesar. Now, the Caesar that was there when Christ was born in chapter 1 and 2 was actually uh, Caesar Augustus. This is Tiberius Caesar. And then there was Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea. And then there was Herod. So you have Tiberius, Pilate, and Herod. This Herod was known as Herod Antipas. He was the son of Herod the Great, the one who slaughtered the babies in Matthew chapter 2 at the birth of Christ. And then you have Philip, the Tetrarch of Iturea, 
the region of Trigonatus and Licinius, the Tetrarch of Abilene. Now, the word Tetrarch literally means fourth part. Keep that in mind. And it's designating the fact that there were four divisions of the land, and these Roman governors had different areas. We would call them counties today, and they ruled over this part of the land, fourth part, they're tetrarchs. And then there were two high priests, verse 2, Annas and Caiaphas. Now, that's to show you how corrupt and in cahoots the priesthood came with Rome. Because Annas was the priest, he was taken out by Rome, and they replaced him with Caiaphas, his nephew. And then we know that Caiaphas was corrupt and in cahoots with Rome. So they were kind of like the mafia of the day. They were placed there by the Roman government. But that's the reason there were two priests. The priest Annas was technically the priest for life, but Caiaphas was appointed there by the Roman government. But the priesthood was corrupt. So the point I want to make was that his calling came at a time of darkness in the land. I have never seen America so dark in all my life. I've never seen such darkness in the land of America. May God call men to preach his word. I'm sorry I can't help but preach this passage thinking in terms of our own nation and the need for God to raise up men to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I want you to notice this call in verse 2. The word of God came unto John. That is a descriptive term for God's calling to John to go preach. I believe that every man who's called to preach should be called by God, have a clear call of God, and hear the call of God, and preach the word of God. So God's word came not to the wicked rulers of Rome or even to the priests, but it came to God's chosen man, John the baptizer. The greatest need in our world today is for men of God who are called by God to preach the word of God. Now you say, well, Pastor John, you, you just say that because that's your calling. God's called you to preach the word. And there may be some truth to that, but I'm convinced that the greatest need in the world today, and start with the United States of America, is men of God called by God preaching the word of God. If you want to transform the United States, transform the pulpits of our nation. I have a passion that has never waned, and this year I'll be speaking to a lot of different pastor groups. My passion is that pastors preach the word. Nothing more, nothing less. And that they make that the primary purpose and calling of their ministry. The number one purpose for the pastor and priority of the pastor is to be a preacher of God's word. And, and if we had men in our pulpits today, if every church was preaching the word of God, we would see a transformation of our nation today. Amen? Amen. So would that the word of God was preached from our pulpits and it was actually brought back into our nation. Jesus said, the harvest is great, the laborers are few, so pray that the Lord of the harvest would send forth laborers. I was thinking about the children in our Sunday school right now. Wouldn't it be awesome if the next Billy Graham was in our Sunday school right now? When I see the kids running around the campus here at church, I say, Lord, raise up a John the Baptist. Raise up a Billy Graham. Raise up pastors, raise up missionaries, raise up preachers and teachers of your word to preach the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, John's preparation, verses one to two. But secondly, if you're taking notes, John's preaching. And this is the, 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 the largest section in this passage. It runs from verse three down to verse 14. Now, let me point out three things about John's preaching. Number one, John's preaching was preparatory. Look at verse three to six. Let's read the story. It came to pass. Here he says, excuse me, he, and he came, that is John, into all the country about Jordan, excuse me, preaching the baptism of repentance 
for the remission of sin. So Luke records right at the beginning of this section that John came to the Jordan out of the wilderness. He was preaching. Every time the word preach or preaching appears in this text today, it has the idea of heralding good news. The Greek word that's used for preach or preaching means to herald or proclaim the gospel, the good news. So verse 3, he was preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Not that baptism forgives our sins, but if you repent and you're saved, then you're baptized as evidence of your salvation, an outward showing of an inward reality. Now, as it is written, so John's ministry is summarized in verse 3 of preaching. As it is written, verse 4, in the book of the words of Isaiah, and he's quoting Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 to 5, the prophet said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight, the rough way shall be made smooth. All flesh, verse 6, shall see the salvation of God. Speaking of the universal focus of Luke's gospel, all flesh shall see the salvation of our God. Now, John's preaching was preparatory. Notice the prophecy in Isaiah 40, verse 3 to 5, quoted here in verse 4, that the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So Isaiah, Malachi chapter 3, both Old Testament prophecies that predicted the forerunner. So John was a priest, John was a prophet, John was a preacher, John was prophesied in the Old Testament that he would be the forerunner of Messiah. John's baptism was interesting because the Jews would baptize Gentile proselytes. Gentile wants to become Jewish, he had to be baptized and circumcised. But this was the right of the Jews now preparing their heart. John's ministry was to prepare the nation of Israel for the receiving of Messiah. John would point to Jesus and say, behold the Lamb of God who carries away the sin of the world. He was preparing them by repenting, getting right with the Lord, baptizing, and then he would hear them. They, they would point them to Jesus. Now, I want to talk about baptism as it relates to repentance and salvation. Baptism is a rite. It's a ritual. If you're not born again or saved or regenerated when you're baptized, it means really nothing. It's just a rite or a ritual. You'll get wet, but you're not forgiven. Baptism does not save you. Baptism doesn't forgive your sins. Baptism is an outward showing of an inward reality. So if any, if any of you have been taught that baptism is necessary or essential for salvation, that's not what the Bible teaches. By grace, you have been saved through faith, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. And that not of yourself, salvation is a gift from God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So if you throw baptism is necessary to be saved, you've just added works to salvation, and it's no longer grace. You say, well, don't we have to believe? Yes, but that's not a work. Trusting in Christ to save you by faith is not a work. And that's for the first step. So the baptism of John was only those who repented. And repentance was part of believing you change your mind. The Greek word is metanoia, about your sin, and it involves a turning around. It literally means 180 degrees. So you change your mind about your sin, about the Savior. You turn around, and then you begin to pursue a life of following Christ. But it's top, coupled together with believing in Jesus. So if you forsake sin, you must receive the Savior. So have you removed all the hindrances in your life as you are preparing the fall of the Lord? Notice verse 3 and 6. 
John's preaching. He said he preached the baptism of repentance for the removal of sin. He's the voice of one crying in the wilderness. And I, I want you to look at verse 5, excuse me. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain shall, hill shall be brought low. The crooked made straight, the rough ways shall be made smooth. All flesh shall see the salvation of God. Whenever a king traveled in those days, it was pretty cool. They had someone go in front of the king and smooth out the rough roads. If there were holes, they'd fill them up. If there were bumps, they'd knock them down. If it was crooked, it would straighten them out. So they would prepare the way for the king. That's the language that's being used here. John is the forerunner of Jesus the king. And it's speaking of our hearts taking away everything that would hinder trusting Christ or believing in him. So we need to remove from our heart the hindrances that will keep us from Christ. So John's preaching was preparing people for Christ. And then secondly, John's preaching was powerful. Look at verse 7, 8, and 9. Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized. So we have all these hundreds or maybe even thousands of people in the Jordan Valley, down by the Jordan River. And this is how he introduced his message. Oh, generation of vipers. Now, how's that for an introduction? He basically called them a bunch of snakes in the grass. John had grew up in the wilderness and he saw snakes out there. And he knew that when there was a fire in the desert, the snakes would run from the bushes into the river. So he says, oh, ye generation of vipers, serpents, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come. John was a fiery preacher who predicted eschatologically future event of the judgment or wrath of God to come. Bring forth, verse 8, therefore fruits worthy of repentance. And be not, begin not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. They boasted, I'm a Jew, I'm a child of Abraham, I can't go to hell, I won't be judged, I'm saved by my race. And John says, no, that's not going to work. He says, now also, verse 9, the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, which brings not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. John's preaching was powerful. The thing I love about John the Baptist is that he didn't hesitate to preach a future coming judgment of God. Prepare your hearts, repent, turn back, or there will be retribution, there will be judgment for your sin. I believe the great need in our country today is for fearless, called, spirit-filled preachers who preach the whole counsel of God. You know, it's popular today in many evangelical churches to not preach about sin. Not preach about the wrath of God, the judgment of God. John mentions hellfire, judgment. He would be called a hellfire preacher today. Now, don't forget, Jesus said, among all those born of women, there's not one greater than John the Baptist. He would actually introduce his sermons, all you serpents. Repent, get right with God. Oh, this isn't very positive. This doesn't make me feel good. You know, the preacher's job is not to make you feel good about your sinful lifestyle. It's to convict you, not comfort you, to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. That's the job of the preacher. One of my favorite passages, I call it my life verse, is 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 5, where Paul says to Timothy, a pastor, preach the word. In the Greek, that's a solemn charge. I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Preach the word. Nothing more, nothing less. You don't add to the word. You don't take away from the word. You don't say, oh, we're going to take out this wrath part. We're going to take out this hell part. We're going to take out this judgment. Repent. No, we don't use that word. Preach the word. 
Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. Don't substitute it for the feel-good, happy life coach. It's kind of a sermon. Be faithful to preach the word. The word there, that phrase means actually herald. The word preach means to herald, means to proclaim. The word is the whole body of Scripture. And he tells them how to preach the word. Be faithful to preach the word. In season, out of season. When it's popular, when it's not popular. To reprove, that means to lay blame. To reprove, to reproach. To can preach with doctrine, with all patience. To reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. He tells them why you should preach the word. For the time will come, and I, I'm, I believe the time has come. It came to me many years ago here in the United States. For men will not endure sound doctrine. But the people in the pew, they will heap to themselves teachers or preachers having itching ears. Now, the itching ears are not the preachers. They're the people's. Tell me what I want to hear. Tell me what is pleasant. Heaped in themselves preachers having itching ears and turn their ears away from the truth, which is the word, and shall be given unto fables. But Timothy, you fulfill your ministry. I think one of the reasons, if not the reason why America's in a mess today is because the church has not faithfully preached the word. We've abandoned the scriptures. We have entertained the people rather than preaching faithfully the word of God. So my passion, my prayer is God give us more faithful preachers of the word like John the Baptist. And John's preaching was also practical. So it was preparatory, it was powerful, and it was practical. Look at verse 10 down to verse 14. And actually this describes what it looks like when a person truly repents and turns back to the Lord. The people ask him, so the multitudes of the people said, what shall we do then? And he answered and said unto them, he that has two coats, the word is tunics, was the undergarments, let him impart to him that hath none, and he that hath food, then do likewise. So the people were told, if you have two coats, give one away. How's that for rubber meets the road? preaching. Go home today, look at your closet. If you have clothes you haven't worn in six years, give it to somebody in need. And he tells all the people, then be generous with what you have. And to him that hath two coats, him that hath none, if you have food, verse 10, or verse 11, excuse me, then give to him that has need. Then the publicans, now they were the tax collectors they were like the mafia of that day. They were rich. They were corrupt. They were wicked people. They ripped people off. They came to be baptized. And most preachers would say, this is awesome. If you have verse 10 and 11, a big crowds of people want to be baptized. Oh, yeah, we'll baptize you. You have publicans. They're rich. Yes, sir, we'll baptize you. You can join our church as long as you tithe. But John says, no, I want to tell you, in verse 12, he said unto them, or verse, 11, verse 13, excuse me, he said to them, exact no more than that which is appointed you. Be honest. Don't rip people off. And then he said to the soldiers, now these are probably Jewish soldiers who had jurisdiction over the temple precincts. Likewise, demanded of him, saying, what shall we do? And he said unto them, do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. Now, these are all characteristics of true repentance. Be generous, be honest, be kind, be truthful, be content. All of those are evidence of genuine repentance. If you say you believe in Jesus and you've turned from your sin to Christ, then you should be generous, you should be honest, you should be kind, you should be truthful, 
and you should be content. Now, this is not what saves you. This is not what saves you. Too many times we hear preaching today, well, just live good, love people, be nice, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. That's all fine, but that's not what saves you. The blood of Christ can only save you. You must be born again to enter the kingdom of God. You must repent and believe in Jesus Christ. Our good works are the fruit of, or the result of true repentance, not the cause. So ask yourself, has your life been showing evidence of true repentance? Now, third thing about John's ministry was the promise that he made. I want you to see that in verse 15 to 18. And as the people were in expectation, that means that they were all wondering if he was the Messiah, all men mused in their hearts, verse 15, of John, whether he were the Christ or not. They thought perhaps he was the Messiah. It shows you how ignorant they were of their own Bibles and scriptures as to who the Messiah would be. John was from the tribe of Levi. The Messiah would be from the tribe of Judah. All they had to do was ask, what tribe are you of? And it right away would solve the problem. He's not the Messiah. But are you the Messiah? John answered, saying unto them, verse 16, I indeed baptize you with water. That would be an outward rite or ritual, external. But one mightier than I, notice that, comes, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. Now notice that John's promise was of a mightier person there, verse 15, down to the first part of verse 16. One mightier than I cometh. So John was pointing to Jesus. J.C. Ryle said, we learn from this text, that a faithful minister will always exalt Christ. One of my favorite black preachers in America that has long since gone to heaven was named E.V. Hill. He pastored Mount Zion Missionary Church in Los Angeles, California. You want to get blessed? Go on YouTube and type in E.V. Hill, pastor, preacher, E.V. Hill. Listen to some of his sermons. And he said he used to have a woman in the front row of his church that would actually say, get him up. Black, I've preached in black churches. It's fun. Get him up. And at first he didn't know what in the world she's talking about. He said, finally, I asked this dear saint, I said, what do you mean, get him up? She goes, get Jesus up. When you preach, pastor, get him up, lift him up, lift Christ up. And he said, I never forgot that in my preaching, get him up. And John the Baptist got him up. He preached Christ. He is greater than I. John said this, he is mightier than I. He is to be preferred before me, for he was before me. He must increase, I must decrease. He is the Lamb of God who carries away the sin of the world. So he promised a mightier person. But notice he also promised a mighty power. Look at the end of verse 16. He cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I'm not worthy to unloose. So John recognized his humility. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. This is powerful. I can only baptize you in water. Jesus will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. Now, I'll talk in a moment about, about, about the fire and what I believe that's referring to. But John promised that Christ, who is mightier than him, would send the power of the Holy Spirit, that he would baptize you in the Holy Spirit. And he goes on to say, and fire. Acts chapter 1, verse 5, the disciples had asked Jesus, will you restore the kingdom to Israel now? You've died, you've risen, you're ready to ascend back to heaven. Is this when the kingdom starts? And Jesus said, it's not for you know the time and the seasons, the Father's place and his power. But you're going to receive power. Same thing that John's predicting here. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, if you know your Bible, this happened in Acts chapter two. 
But we fail to note quite often is that was the birthday of the church. That's the day the church was born and formed and we were baptized by the Spirit, the disciples, into one body and united and identified with Christ, the head. Now when we believe in Jesus Christ and trust him, we are taken out of Adam, we're placed in Christ, the church, and we're united to him, the head. Look at 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, when you get a chance. Paul said, know you not that we've all been baptized by one spirit into one body? We've all been made to drink of one spirit? Jesus promised the paracletos, the comforter, in John's gospel that he would come. And so Jesus would send the spirit and he would baptize them into one body, one church, and he would fill them. Now, if you're a believer, you can't become a Christian without the Holy Spirit. He convicts you or convinces you of sin. If you just come to Jesus and you weren't convicted or convinced of being a sinner, then you're not really going to come to Christ in true repentance. So the Spirit of God convicts or convinces you, draws you, then you, by faith, trust him to save you. At that very moment, you are regenerated or born again. You're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. You're sealed by the Holy Spirit. You're baptized in the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit fills you, empowers you, guides you, and directs you. So he is mightier. He will send the power of the Spirit. And then notice third thing. John promised a mighty purge. And this is verse 17 and 18. Now notice at the end of verse 16, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. This is what perplexed Bible students. What does he mean by the fire? And we normally kind of assume, and it's possible, that the fire is to be related to the Spirit of God. Remember in the day of Pentecost, there was the cloven tongues of fire. Fire purifies that which is valuable and destroys that which is worthless. So it could be that he's referring to the Spirit purging us with that burning fire. But notice in verse 17, and there's no chapter verse divisions in the original, whose fan is in his hand. This, is, this word fan here means fork, and it's a winnowing fork that they use to winnow the grain from the chaff at harvest time, whose fan is in his hand or winnowing fork is in his hand, he will thoroughly purge his floor and will gather the wheat unto the garner, the barn, but the chaff, notice that, he will burn, he mentions fire at the end of verse 16, now he mentions burning the chaff with fire unquenchable and many other things exhortated them preached unto them and to the people. Now, my belief is, and I could be wrong, I'm not dogmatic about it, but I believe that the fire in reference to the baptism is to be tied in with verse 17, and that takes place at the second coming of Jesus Christ, and it's a fire of judgment upon unbelievers. That he comes the first time, to save us from sin, he sends us the Holy Spirit for those who believe and repent and receive Christ. He's coming back the second time with a winnowing fork in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor. Now, that imagery is taken from when they would want to separate at harvest time the chaff from the wheat. So they would have the threshing floor, and they would have it in a high lifted up area. They would like to do it on a breezy, windy day. They would take the fan, King James, or the fork. They would take the grain and toss it, toss it, and toss it into the air. And the wind would blow off the chaff, the outside skin of the husk of the grain, to a pile next to the grain. Then they would gather the chaff together, and they would burn it because it's worthless. So this is a picture of end times judgment. So he comes the first time to baptize with the Spirit of God. He'll come the second time to baptize with the judgment of God. And notice how John describes it. He will burn with fire on 
quenchable. Read Psalm 1 when you get a chance. At the end of Psalm 1, but the ungodly are not so. They're like the chaff, which the wind drives away. They'll not stand on the day of judgment. So the chaff there is a picture of judgment. And it's interesting, in Matthew 25, verse 41, Jesus speaking said, Then shall he also say unto them on his left side, the goats, Depart from me, ye cursed unto everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Now here you have a preacher who's preaching hell, fire, and judgment. And Jesus said he's the greatest that ever was born of women. But yet so many pastors today avoid that subject. Be faithful to rightly preach the word. Don't compromise the word. Now here's last point in verse 19 and 20. John's imprisonment. But Herod, this is Herod the Tetrarch, he was known as Herod Antipas, being reproved by him, by who? By John. And you talk about winning friends and influencing people. Calls them snakes. Tells them that some of them, if they don't repent, we're going to hell. And that Herod actually had him for Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, put in prison for all the evils which he had done. Verse 20, added yet this above all. So all the wicked, horrible things that Herod did shut John up in prison. Wow. If you're going to preach like John the Baptist, be ready to lose your head. I have seen leading evangelical preachers and pastors interviewed on TV and ask about homosexuality and gay marriage. And they waffle. They won't take a stand. They won't speak up. They won't speak the truth in love. It's sad. It's tragic. Here you have Herod, this great powerful ruler, divorced his wife, then seduced and stole his brother's wife, who she was, Herodias was his niece, and marries her. And John points right into his face. Doesn't say it in the Bible, this is my John the Baptist. (laughs) He probably came down off the stage, walked down the aisle, called Herod out, he's sitting in the fifth pew right there, (laughs) pointing right at him, and said, you're an adulterer, you're a sinner, repent. And so Herod put him in jail to silence his voice. And eventually he had to take his head off because Herodias' daughter seduced Herod with her dance, went back to her mother, said, what shall I ask for? He wants to give me anything I want. And she said, ask for the head of John the Baptist on a platter. They actually came back to Herod with a platter and John's head on that platter. You know, when Jesus heard that John was executed, Jesus actually got sad. He went away to pray for a while. You preach the word of God faithfully, uncompromisingly, and it'll be off with his head. Throw him in prison. This is the long line of faithful preachers who've been put to death for simply preaching the truth gospel. May God give us more John the Baptist today. Amen? Let's pray.